Paul Cezanne is perhaps one of the most important painters to have ever lived. After Impressionism, he came along and opened a door onto much in the 20th century that became abstract art or very much influenced by the abstract principles that he brought to bear in his work. Every time Cezanne puts down a brush stroke, it's either a vertical line, a horizontal line, a 45 degree line, the angle of the sinister or the Baroque diagonal. It is going to be the angle of the reciprocal. Let me show you what those lines are. This is the Baroque diagonal. This is the sinister diagonal. If I, this is the phi rectangle, this is the dominant vertical. That is a square. This is a reciprocal, and this is a reciprocal, and it intersects this at 90 degrees. It should do. It does, all right? So right here, you see, we have a dominant horizontal. See it? And where that intersects, we have the other vertical. And this is a reciprocal. And that's a reciprocal. And now <clears throat> we can start to find where all of these linear elements run and where they go. But what I want you to notice is these are all vertical touches. He's found this slope. And he has it repeated here and repeated here. And it's coming from that reciprocal. Do you see it? This is repeating the horizontal. And probably it's falling on that intersection there. From where it hits here, we could run it down to that corner. And we get this line where it intersects that. We can get a horizontal. So none of these are arbitrary. If I go from here to where this hits here, I get that line. And if I go from here to that point, I get this line. So every one of these lines is coming from someplace. Do you see it? He's got this diagonal repeated all the way through. He's carrying that all the way through. And everything is measured. Everything is on a golden section division. And that you'll appreciate later. But this sort of demonstrates, I think with good clarity, how important these straight line intervals are to artists. And that they really are hung on an armature in a rectangle of specific proportions. And the divisions conform to those that are suitable for that particular rectangle. And artists choose them because each of these rectangles has certain properties and certain angles that they deem appropriate for the particular piece that they're painting. This is a painting of a wall of greenery by Corot, another 19th century, early 19th century French artist. And he painted this in Italy. Now, if you, if you look at a wall of green, how are you going to bring it alive? What on earth can you do to make it interesting? And how would anyone say that wall of green now is a painted masterpiece? And I think this is. I think this is a brilliant piece of landscape. These are sketches. These are not the pieces he sent to the salon to support his family with. These are the things he did for his own gratification. And boy, he brought so much verve and spontaneity to them. They're just incredible. His finished pieces are a bit labored, and they're kind of sentimental, but they paid, paid the overhead. So let's see some of the devices that he employs. There's more variety in the original painting that we're seeing in this 15th generation reproduction. You've got to understand that I don't have a collection of masterworks to show you. I'm using reproductions that are photographs from books that I've photographed again and again. They're now in slides. When you see them in museums, you'll be overwhelmed by how differently they look from everything you've come to expect. But that's why you go to museums. On the other hand, I'm doing the best I can with slides. To bring this alive, Corot has employed 
a device called radiating lines. This line comes down and it hits here. See it? It hits that. From here it radiates out and it hits this and that and that and it hits that. You have a vertical coming down. From here it comes here and it slices that and it comes up to that dark shadow. It comes out, there'll be a horizontal coming in here. He's coming from here and he's swinging it through this and he hits here. If I take this out of the corner, it's coming down to this point and it's coinciding with that. It's hitting this, it's hitting this point. It's giving me that vertical, all right? It's like billiards, these things float. And here I've got a horizontal, coincides with that, coincides with this. And from here I can come down and I can hit this and hit that. And come down, I can come down here and I can hit this. I can come down, I can hit that. I can bring this in, I can bring that in, and I'll, I'll c carry it through. I can take this through here, hit that point, I can find relationships here and I can start running more lines through these and from this point I can come down and find all of these divisions. This is clearly a coincidence. You can see how it is. Suddenly this thing is alive with, with a dynamic subconscious, an invisible, throbbing geometry which brings it alive. Now the layman doesn't know what's influencing him, but there's no question about the fact that we have a visceral response to that which underlies this composition. And artists have known that they have this ability almost to reach inside your gut and make you feel what they want you to feel. And this subliminal, secret, subterranean activity is the life's blood of the peace. He's a brilliant, a brilliant painter. And he, he, if you look, even the clouds are organized with straight lines. I'm telling you, they don't exist in nature, but when you squint, you'll begin to believe you see them. That connects with this, connects with that, etc. You can begin to see all of these connections, horizontals, reciprocal, repeated through. And then there is a sweeping curve coming through here, isn't there? and it comes back through there and through here and through there and it hits here and touches that and it comes down and it hits this. He has a knot coming here and it touches that. Do you see it? It comes back through here. It comes back through this. There's an arc swinging down this way and that way and this way. Do you see how active this is? There are so many ways that you can create relationships, order, vibration, rhythm, intervals, sweeps, and these people were trained. They were trained. It took seven to ten years to train a Renaissance apprentice, and most of that time was spent on geometry, and nobody tells you what geometry that was. What were these systems of the golden section? Do you see how alive that is? Do you see how animated it is? Oh my lord, it's, it's stunning. And on top of that, he's a brilliant colorist and a master of value. And these are just touches of color on a piece of canvas. And this is Van Doesburg. The upper left hand corner, this abstract artist appraises the geometry of a cow. Now he's doing what I'm asking you to do. He's seeing that cow as a series of simple rectangles a series of vertical divisions, horizontal divisions, and just a few diagonals. And when he gets done appraising it and looking at it from in front and in back and the side, he develops this abstraction and it's wonderful. It's really superb. You can make a sculpture out of it, a painting out of it, and it's full of fun. Hmm? Again, a fellow with a sense of humor and the ability to communicate what he finds entertaining. So let's come back to Earth. We have your three pet bottles. You're going to arrange them in front of you. Come sa. 
I don't give you the opportunity to be self-expressive, creative, or any of that good stuff. I just want you to solve this simple problem simply, and your work, if you're successful, will all look alike. This is the second piano lesson you're taking, and as you sit waiting for your piano teacher, you hear all the other students playing Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. This is Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. We're not talking about expressing yourself. When you get to art school, you'll be a freshman. You're, you're majoring in fine arts, and your teacher's going to talk to you as if you're a professional artist. They do that so that they can leave you alone and go off and have coffee in the faculty lounge, and they don't have to be burdened by teaching you anything. Believe me, as freshmen, you are not professional artists. So this is it. You'll set it up. You'll light it. You'll put it on a white ground and a white background. And you'll bring this in to the studios next week when you arrive. The first bottle is darker. Second bottle is less dark. The third is lighter. And then the last line, which is just a touch too dark, is the table line. It should have been lighter than this, and it's not. I believe we threw this student off the fire escape. <laughs> and I want you to know he bounced, all right? <laughs> And you want each uh, cut to be the middle, where the line cuts into the middle. Yes, make it the middle, yeah. Not thirds or either. If you can manage thirds and it looks clean enough so it doesn't look as if it's going to l dribble down here like that poor young printing student apprentice, fine. But you know that this is safe when you're coming to something that tiny. You know, if it were three feet, a third, a golden section of vision a quarter, any of these things would be serviceable. Half might be suitable. But this is a tiny little line, all right? This is very, very nice. So I want the border. I want the field. I want the notional space of the three organized. And I want, I want this to be a little less dark than the dominant line, but I want it to be bold enough. And I want you to do all of this those of you coming through a second time, you may decide this is a phi, this is a root three, etc. You can do that, all right? And then, I want gesture drawings. And now I want gesture drawings of all three bottles. Ideally, I want the first one darker than the second, and the second one, not as, and the second one darker than the third. So it can be aerial perspective. And I want this to be as vigorous as you can make it. And I want you to draw the individual triangles and the circle. I don't want you to keep going over and over the outline of the bottle. I want you to be drawing the es essential geometric figures that these bottles consist of. I want you to see. Yes. I want six on a, I want six on a page, and I want maybe five, five pages. A bunch. They'll take, they'll take you a few minutes apiece. These are three-dimensional because they're spheres, but they do give you the aerial perspective sequence that I'm after. You can draw the notional spaces if you wish. There's so much you can do now. We've covered a good deal of ground. So that is what you'll bring in. So this is a much lighter week than last because I want you to, where it's appropriate, redo those bottles where they're not good enough. Then I want you to arrange them on a piece of paper with scotch tape, and you're all going to come up with the same solution because no other solution is available. If you want to do something creative, do it, but don't show me. Not this week, all right? Next semester, I'm interested. This semester, I desperately want you to come to terms with this bit of information and be able to use it effectively. So that brings us, unless you have questions, No, it, 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 if you can hit many, many things that aren't, the more coincidences you can organize in a piece, 
that are parallel, the faster the movement in that direction. Somebody like Van Gogh had this down pat. I mean, just phenomenal. I'll, I'll show some of those drawings in the course. When you have bottles and things, then you don't want them to coincide here because you want them to overlap and create the greatest illusion of space and depth. Mirandi was saying, that isn't my goal. My goal is to restore the two-dimensional surface of my canvas. The French surrealist Magritte did a painting of a pipe. And in French it said under, this is not a pipe. What did he mean? It's a painting of a pipe. It's a painting of a pipe. It's not a pipe. So, Morandi said, I'm not interested in the trickery of creating the third dimension. I've mastered that. He showed us that early piece. He said, I'm excited by the interplay of shape, distortion, violating the rules, keeping things very, very flat. Seurat kept many things very flat. Gauguin painted flatly, and he imitated Egyptian art when he did those great murals in Tahiti. Muralists tend to be more concerned with the flatness of the wall. They don't want great scenes of the sky that break through the wall the way the Venetians did all over Germany. They think that's kind of, I mean, you respect the wall the way Michelangelo and Botticelli and Giotto and everybody in Renaissance Italy did. <clears throat> you keep it flat. Pouet de Chavan does this as well. He keeps it flat. This is Morandi's goal. And he brings to his work a sense of humor, a lightness, but a tremendous amount of integrity. These are magnificently designed. And his best work is brilliant. And he's made of himself one of the more important painters of the 20th century. That's pretty good. But he's setting out to do something very different from what I'm asking you to do. I don't know what you'll ultimately wish to do. You may wish to remain two-dimensional. You may wish to play with transitions from two dimensions to three. There are a lot of artists who play these games. There are so many things you can do. My responsibility to the extent that I can fulfill it is to provide you with as many useful tools and levels of understanding as I possibly can in 18 weeks. And if you're coming through the second time, I think you're discovering this is an entirely different course from the first one. Mary, you're listening to it differently, aren't you? Same, but you don't understand it the first time. No. There's no framework to put it in. Right. So you and this, don't even think certain things are important the first time through. So it becomes a so and, and and you'll be using the golden section in this first and second lesson when you didn't reach it until the seventh lesson, the first time you came through. So you've got a whole series of additional qu queries to make because it's become more complex and I've raised the bar. This works. But I'd like to thank uh, Kelsey Landon, Sarah Claus, Jess Worma, and uh, Aubrey. pardon me? Aubrey. Aubrey Brown, yes, please. All of these kids were very useful and very helpful throughout the whole program. And they're here to learn how to teach. And there's nothing that teaches you the material better than teaching it. It is a blessing, and a lot of my students have become teachers, and a lot of them have discovered that you can put yourself through art school teaching drawing in somebody's house, and you're giving that child a free ride. And you can pick up four or five hundred dollars a weekend without having to say, would you like fries with that? <laughs> so you drive carefully, you know what I'm asking of you, and I'll see you right here at the scene of the crime next week. May your gods go with you. Take Here's care. Here's my question.